I, 40 male, started to cheat on my wife, 38 female, but stopped halfway through. Do I still tell her? My wife and I have had a great relationship. I can't say I have any real complaints. We have been together for five years, married for two of those, and up until now, I would have said I would never stray. You're not making your case for you strong, buddy. I was away for work last week, and while I was in the hotel, a young woman, 21 female, sat next to me and began to flirt with me. Can I just say something about being on business trips, okay? I've been on a few in my life. I have to admit, it was a real ego boost to be flirted by someone so young. I started to get that middle-aged dad bod and have been feeling like I'm losing my looks a bit. After a bit of talking, the woman invited herself back up to my hotel room where especially by a very young woman. See, the keyword young. I was slightly junk, and I figured I'll probably never get the opportunity to sleep with a 21-year-old again. Disgusting! You're 40! Ew! But the thrill wore off very quickly as I realized that I wasn't enjoying myself. This girl was not good in bed. She basically just laid there and starfished. Sometimes she would pull herself into what she thought was a sexy pose, but that was it. She didn't seem interested in me at all. I might as well have been a human dildo because she seemed more interested in herself and how sexy she thought she was. Sleeping with my wife has always been amazing. When I'm with my wife, she's all over me, talking to me, and telling me how hot I am, grabbing me, touching me, getting on top, and so on. I feel like the hottest guy in the world when I'm in bed with my wife. With this girl, I felt like I could just leave the room and she might not even notice, let alone care. She seemed like she just wanted the ego boost of a guy finding her attractive. I couldn't stay aroused and I stopped about 10 minutes into it and asked her to leave, which she did. I just took a shower and then called my wife to hear her voice. Now I'm back home and so far I haven't told my wife about any of it. There's a guilty part of me that says I should because she deserves to know but another part of me says why should I torpedo our happy marriage and cause her pain for something that I didn't even enjoy and will never do again. All it did was prove to me that I want my wife more than anyone else. I want to do the right thing but I genuinely don't know what the right thing to do is here. I know that I will never ever stray again. Should I tell her or keep it to myself? I'd never been to Prague and the trip was last minute so I had little time to prepare. My travel partner had dumped me in another country and I was determined to make the best out of my trip by visiting a place I'd never been. Upon arrival at the train station, I visited the accommodation office and asked for a hostel not far from the center. In my early 20s, winging it was part of the fun. These days, I'm far less adventurous. The hostel they sent me to was a sprawling, crumbling, slate gray art deco building. The inside was probably beautiful at one time but by the time I checked in, it was full of shabby mismatched furniture and cheap stained carpet. Most of the light fixtures were broken, leaving everything but the lobby dark and gloomy. It smelled of standing water and dust. I found my room a double for $12 per night and made note of the fact that I had a roommate. She wasn't there, but on her side of the room, there was a suitcase, dress neatly folded across the back of the plastic chair, a scattering of makeup containers on the beat up desk, and a stack of German fashion magazines on the bed. I spent the afternoon exploring Old Town Square. I purchased some Czech crystal for my mom and painted eggs from a street vendor for myself. I also made reservations for a sunset dinner cruise for one. Oh, nice. I know, ideal. Wow. At around 6 p.m., I returned to my room to shower, change clothes, and unload my purchases. When I left my room about an hour later, there was no indication that my roommate had returned at any point during the day. After the cruise, I stopped at a tiny bar and had a glass of wine. I heard horror stories about the dangers of Prague, but I felt no more trepidation than I did in any other large city. Sure, the cobblestone streets, backlit gothic architecture, and winding alleys made me think think of Jack the Ripper and Dracula, but in a good way. In a good way. I don't know how. What? It was nearly midnight when I returned to my hostel, so I was surprised to find that my roommate still hadn't returned. This wasn't uncommon, though. Backpackers are a fickle lot. She could have gone on a short overnight trip and just left her stuff behind, hooked up with a guy or girl, hey. and was holed up at their place. So I was surprised, but not concerned. I took another shower before bed and was surprised to find that things in the room had changed upon my return. Her bed was neatly turned down, the magazines had moved to the nightstand, and the dress was gone. The strangest thing, though, was the addition of a pink, silky nightgown spread across my bed. Maybe she thought she still had the room to herself. I didn't see how. My shopping bags, clothes, and toiletries were in plain view. I gently moved the nightgown over to her bed and then settled in for the night, as I wrote in my journal. I assumed she was in the shower or somewhere nearby, so I expected her to return shortly. After about an hour, though, her side was still empty. I needed to use the restroom before I went to sleep, so I made one last trip down the hall. The building was unusually quiet. There weren't the regular sounds of chatty backpackers, the clinking of glasses, or music that would normally leak through the walls. There was dot 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 
nothing. I found myself practically tiptoeing back. My room was near the end of the hall, and I couldn't shake the feeling that the corridor was darker than before. The few working lights were blinking, and it reminded me of a funhouse. A tightness began to fill my stomach, and I subconsciously quickened my steps. There wasn't a soul behind me, yet I kept glancing over my back shoulder, convinced I'd see someone gaining momentum upon me. Oh my god, I don't like this. I was floored with relief as I flung open my door, but it didn't last long. Everything was exactly as I left it, except for the silky nightgown, which was now back on my bed. Ah! Sleep came in fits and starts. I left the lamp on for a while, still convinced my roommate would be right back, but the shadows it cast made the room even spookier. It was too dark with the light off. I'd finally slipped into a deep sleep when I suddenly heard the door open. A man stood in the <gasps> darkened doorway, the hall light behind him, showing just enough for me to see his contorted face. Quote, I didn't mean to, he sobbed. You have to help me. Oh my god. Too confused and disoriented to be scared, I sat up, scrubbed my eyes, and reached for the lamp switch. But once the room was lit, I saw that the door was closed. There was no man. I quickly bound off the bed and went for the door. It was locked. Nobody could have entered without a key. And the hallway? Empty. I passed the rest of the night fully clothed, sitting up in bed and with the light on. Yeah. Though I'd paid for two more nights, at 7 a.m., I gathered all of my stuff and went down to the reception desk to check out. By the way, I said to the 20-something receptionist, my roommate never returned. I'm a little concerned. She picked up the room key, looked at it hard, frowned, and then glanced at her computer. Quote, what room were you in again? When I repeated it to her, she looked back at her screen. Quote, ma'am, that room's been empty for three weeks and it's been cleaned since then. We only have six people in the whole building. The hostel has since been renovated and is now a luxury hotel. The end. Found out, I've been dating my father for almost four months. So I've never met my dad. He ran off when my mom found out she was pregnant with me. My brother was only 8 months old at the time, so he also has no memory of him. There are no pictures of him anywhere, and my mom hates talking about him. All I know is that he was emotionally abusive to her, and a real asshole. I, 25 meters, have a thing for older men. Call it daddy issues or a fetish or whatever you want, but I pretty much only date or sleep with men 40 and up. My family doesn't know this, or that I'm gay for that matter. It wouldn't be an issue, they just never ask, we don't really share personal things like that. About 6 months ago I met David, fake name, duh, at a club. We hit it off great, he's in great shape for his age, supposedly 43, although that's a lie, he's actually 47 as I've found out, really attractive, charming, etc. He left for a 2 week work trip a few days, after we met but we kept messaging each other, and I really liked him, which is rare for me. We went on a date, after he came back, and have pretty much been dating ever since. He has a lot of money, and I'm kind of a sugar baby but that's not the reason I was attracted to him, definitely A plus though. I didn't tell anyone, we were dating except for two of my best friends. He also never met any of my friends or family and I never met his. This changed last night. We were at a restaurant, when out of the corner of my eye I spotted my mom. I don't live at home and we only usually text if we need something, so I didn't know she'd be there and dbh I still don't know why she was, she hates going out and thinks it's a waste of money. She had not seen us yet but David noticed me looking at her. I'll forever remember the way his face changed, when he saw her. His expression went from his casual, charming smile he always had to this blank, panicked look. I obviously noticed, and got a really bad feeling, so I asked him what's wrong, and he just got up and excused himself. I kept asking him where he was going, and grabbed him so he couldn't just leave. At this point, I was really confused and suspicious, but I would have never guessed, what would happen next. I don't think anything could ever prepare me for it. At some point while, he was getting up my mother must have spotted us, because next thing I know she's next to our table, asking me what was going on. I couldn't really pinpoint her facial expression, because it looked like she was horrified but again, at this point I didn't know David was my father, and she doesn't know I'm gay. David is visibly uncomfortable, and looks like he wants to die, he was literally sweating. I, assume this was, because he didn't want my mother to know. I was dating someone of his age. I was about to try to explain what was going on to my mom when she said why would you go behind my back like this. I was so confused, because again, I didn't know he was my dad so like what was she going on about? She probably assumed I had looked for and met up my father without talking to her about it despite her telling us how badly he treated her. To me, however, it seemed like she was acting crazy for no reason. I kind of took it personally and thought she was trying to tell me who to date and what to do so I casually told her that I was just on a date with my boyfriend and I tried to grab David's hand 
but he just jumped up and ran away. He literally bolted like a fucking Olympic runner. I cannot get the fucking image out of my head of him jumping between waiters to get away. Everyone was staring at us by this point, it was so embarrassing, and I was mortified. My mom looked like she was frozen in place. I was more confused than ever, I had no idea what was happening. I had assumed, she had asked me that, because she didn't want me to be gay, which made no sense, she is very open and liberal, or date older men, which made a bit more sense but was still none of her business. But her expression just made my skin crawl, it's like I could feel the horror, she must have been experiencing. She just told me to get up, and come with her. I was still confused, but something in her body language told me to just do as I was told, I quickly paid for our drinks, and appetizers, thank god the main course hadn't been served yet, bc damn was that shit expensive. My mom excused herself to her friends, and once we were in her car outside, we just sat there in silence for what felt like at least 10 minutes. I didn't really dare to say anything, I was still processing that, my boyfriend just fucking ran away from me and my mother. I had also tried to text him, but he wasn't responding, shocker, I know. When my mom spoke, it sounded like she had been shot. She sounded so wounded, I think it might haunt me forever. She asked me who that, man was and I explained to her, and I went on about how much I loved him because again, I was still thinking of David as my boyfriend, and assumed my mom's reaction was, because of his age or gender. I cannot believe that, I went on about how much I romantically loved my dad right to my mother's face. It makes me want to puke. Long story short, she told me he was my father and that she instantly recognized him. That talk was the most traumatic experience of my life. We both started crying at some point, and just wept for a while in the car. I was howling, it was fucking primal. I'm not usually emotional, or prone to crying so it was really shocking to me just, how much pain a person can feel. Most of it had just a blur now, especially compared to how clearly, I remember every offer moment of the evening up to this. We drove home. I slept in my old bedroom. We haven't talked about it, since but my brother is also staying at our place still, he's a med student, never moved out BC of housing costs, and he knows something's up. Tried talking to me about it, and I just broke down again. How do I ever tell anyone about this? The worst part is I think, despite all of this I still love David? Just writing that makes me want to throw up. I cannot believe this is reality. Like how fucked is all of this? Why did this happen to me? I don't even think I could tell my therapist about this. I tried messaging David, but I just don't know what to say. The last message, I sent him literally just says please call me, I love you, sent right after he ran away. Like what the fuck? What the actual fucking fuck? Like how do I come back from this? How do I ever look my mom in the eye again? I haven't left my room yet, and I'm in tears again while writing this. I can't even remember the last time, I cried before yesterday, and now I've been doing it non-stop. If anyone has any advice, as if, who the fuck else would ever accidentally do this, besides stupid me, it would be highly appreciated. Also feel free to make dark jokes about this, it's my coping mechanism. I also did not proofread this, as I don't think I can bring myself to read it again. Haunted real life stories from Auntie C. I love me some paranormal investigation, I do. And I am one of the extremely lucky few who can say that I've gotten to spend the entire night in the Goldfield Hotel, the most haunted place in Nevada and probably one of the most haunted places in the world. Ouch. Oh, I forgot, trigger warning. If you're watching this at midnight or 3 or 3.33 in the morning, shut it down. Watch it in the morning over coffee during the safety of the day. Yeah, you have been warned. Cause this shit's scary, yo. The Goldfield Hotel is notorious for having multiple portals to hell and D-word activity. If you're new to my page and don't know what D word means, it rhymes with semen and lives down there and starts with a D. But when we left the next morning, we did not leave alone. In fact, almost immediately after getting home, things started getting weird. And when I say weird, I mean scary AF. As a medium, I could tell almost immediately that we had brought in home multiple spirits, but that was the least of our worries. We unfortunately had some D words tag along too. All of which began wreaking immediate havoc in our home and on our family. A woman, a man named George, and two young children, along, like I said, with the D-words. George did not play nice, and the woman was obsessed with my husband. And the D-words started affecting him and working through him as well. So let's get to it. I'll share as much as I can in this video, but I'll have to make a couple of other videos explaining the other stories. I've never been able to figure out what my spirit animal is, and that will tie in later. I'll explain. I will share the three experiences that all tie together. One night I was awoken from my sleep, to the sound of my husband screaming. It sounded like this. I shot right up out of bed. 
But shooting up out of bed, that's all I did. I just sat there. I didn't try to wake him. I didn't try to do anything. I just sat there staring at him when he continued to scream, <laughs> guys, I did nothing. After saying this a few more times, Mike shot up out of bed, gasping for air in total panic, all while I just sat there and looked. I have medical knowledge and the entire time I thought he was having a stroke, but I did nothing. I felt like the worst wife in the world. As he shot up out of bed, I could see pure terror on his face. And there I sat, so ashamed that I had literally done nothing for my husband. And although he was asleep, he knew. And he said, why didn't you do anything? I was so ashamed. Once he gathered himself, he began telling me about this nightmare. He said he thought that I had crawled into bed next to him like I always do and he went to spoon me. But that seconds later, he realized whatever it was he was spooning was not me. He said it was like a skeleton. It was so small. When he looked down to see what it was, he saw a creature. He called it a zombie, but I know it was a D-word. And it was laying in his arms going, <coughs> trying to get to him. So that's when he began screaming, turn on the fucking light. That's what he was trying to say. He said he finally reached over this creature in order to turn on the lamp. And when he did, it screamed and fled under the bed. Mike explained at that point, it sounded like some sort of a dog was under the bed and began shredding it and tearing it to pieces. Again, guys, disclaimer, if you're watching this at midnight, 3, 3.30, 3.33 in the morning, shut it down. Watch it in the safety of the day. So as I sat up in my bed while Mike screamed, and on the up and light, in his sleep, I did nothing. You guys, when I say the guilt of this, it consumed me. I felt like the worst wife in the world. I did nothing. So in Mike's dream, he had some sort of a thing crawl into bed next to him and he assumed it was me. He went to spoon it as that's how we sleep and it only took him seconds to realize it was not me. He said it felt like a damn skeleton. When he looked down, he saw the most disgustingly horrific creature laying there just far enough out of reach for him to be safe, but it was coming for him. And I hate this look that I have to make, but this is what it was doing. <laughs> he said it had black saliva and was just ferocious. He was screaming at me, turn on the fucking light. But in his dream, all he could get out was on the fucking light. And like I explained, I shot up out of bed, but I did nothing. I just sat there. I just looked at him. I didn't try to wake him. I didn't do anything. I was a medical assistant at that time for a surgeon. I thought he was having a stroke and I did nothing. Anyways, because I didn't do anything after he screamed multiple times, he decided the only way to get rid of this thing or save himself was to turn on the light himself. He had to physically reach over this creature that was trying to attack him to turn on our lamp. But the second he turned on the light, he said that creature just screamed and slithered under our bed. And he said instantly he heard something under the bed that sounded like a very large dog attack this creature and ripping it to shreds. He could hear it screaming and writhing in pain and the dog growling and tearing it apart. This dream really shook Mike and it really upset me. It put a lot of massive guilt on me for not doing a thing for my husband. I have a very tight knit circle of friends who are exactly like me, psychics, gifted, and we check in on one another in situations where we think one of the other person's being attacked by a D-word. I got four phone calls that morning from that circle of friends saying, Colette, you are under a D-word attack. One of my more gifted friends called and said, holy shit, sis, this is bad. She said, Mike had a dream last night, didn't he? And we don't tell each other anything. We let each other go with no details to figure it out. I said, yeah, he did. She described the dream, the creature, and even my guilt. I started crying. I said, sis, I'm the worst wife in the world. I did nothing. Now, remember in part one when I said I've never been able to figure out my spirit animal? Well, I found out that day. Now, remember, I haven't told my friend a detail at all about my husband's dream. She said, sis, you feel guilty. You feel like you did nothing for your husband. She said, when in fact, you did everything. Confused, I asked her, sis, what do you mean? She said, the reason you didn't move on the bed was you weren't there and you saved your husband. That creature that was under the bed, the dog, that wolf, it was you. You were what shredded that D word under the bed. And in that moment, it all made sense. I got pregnant at 16. My parents disowned me and tried taking custody of my daughter. After 10 years, my father was diagnosed with terminal cancer and both want to reconnect with me and get to know their grandchild. I need help on how to handle this. At 16, I slept with my good friend, Jared. The condom broke and my daughter was created. My parents, who were great until this point, didn't like that and wanted me to get an abortion. I couldn't bring it over myself to. I wanted to keep the baby. Of course my parents told me to pack my stuff and leave the house and their lives. So I did. I went to my friend's house and his parents took me in. They weren't thrilled but they said that we all had to help as a new family member was in the making. In that time my friend and I started to develop feelings for each other. I had my daughter and about two months later Jared's brother came back into their lives. He was a recovering heroin addict. As we had the baby, my mother-in-law told him he could not stay with us. 
Eventually they let him stay more and more and he was spending nights until he had a relapse and stole a bunch of stuff. My parents got wind of that. They dug up a bunch of stuff and found out that my mill also fought addiction after an accident she had 15 years ago left her addicted to pain meds. So they called CPS on us and a whole ass investigation was opened. It was a dark time I thought they were going to take my baby. In the end they didn't find anything substantial. But them calling CPS on me transformed into a tradition over the years. As it was a small town every mistake I made got back to my parents. I was half an hour late to pick up due to my job. CP's charges because neglect. I was out after 10 p.m. with my toddler. This happened twice because we went to family gatherings. CP's. Christmas loads of people stayed at Jared's house because it was a big family. CP's because many strange men were there. They eventually stopped it because they were fined for calling them on me unnecessarily. If they had done it more I think it could have been an offense. The last call was five years ago. Eventually Jared and I married when we were 23 and we are quite happy. We worked retail jobs and studied. It took us longer than average to graduate but we did. With a lot of help of his parents. Jared is now an engineer and I work as a graphic designer. We were able to afford a big flat and finally moved out of his parents' house. Our lives look normal now. Anyway a week ago I get a call from me mother who told me my father was diagnosed with terminal cancer and that his ultimate wish is to see me and my daughter again. I don't really know what to do. Because while they didn't have to take care of my while I was pregnant I wished they had at least supported me. And while I get that they were panicking because they thought I was going to be an unfit mother, they made my life hell for 5 years. After 10 years my father was diagnosed with terminal cancer and both want to reconnect with me and get to know their grandchild. I need help on how to handle this. Hey it's me. I wanted to update you on what happened. Edit, apparently I have to make this clear. This is just an update post I have taken my decision. My parents will not meet my daughter until she is older and wants to. After some thought I decided to first meet my parents alone. I wanted to make a decision based on their remorse and development as human beings. And they sadly didn't really change. When I agreed to meet I also told them it would be without my kid. IDKY but they thought they were going to meet her. They had bought presents and all. They were very disappointed to say it lightly when I showed up without her. They made no deal to hide it. But we talked. They failed to take any real responsibility for their actions. Every apology began with, we are sorry if you. When confronted about the CPS calls they say they were doing what was best for daughter. I got really mad but tried not to snap. They brought up every mistake I did as a young mother and that they just thought I was far too young and irresponsible to have a kid. That daughter only turned up good because of luck. After they said that I laid down money for my meal stood up and said. Well nothing has changed. You are still the heartless persons that threw me out years ago and made my life hell for five years. You will never meet her. She is happy and she has loving grandparents. They started to freak out saying that I couldn't withhold their grandchild from them. I just said that you lay in the bed you make. I left and haven't talked to them since. Mails or letters from them are thrown out on the spot. I will eventually explain to my daughter what happened to me and my parents and will give her the chance to meet them when she is older but for now I don't want to deal with their BS. Edit, guys thank for your concerns but I am non-US. Grandparent rights are not a thing where I come from. Edit 2, I think some of you are confused. I am not asking about advice of we thee or not I should give in to my parents request. That's what my last post was about. It's not unwillingness to reflect it's a set decision. Also yes my daughter is in therapy due to her being traumatized by all that lovely CPS visit that were caused by my parents. So I in fact know my child is happy and healthy mentally as well as physically. Did you know that you can get one to three years in prison for tampering with a witness? I didn't either, but let me tell you how I found out. All right, so boom. My old job used to have a self-service section, so you could literally go up there, put your card in, and you could use any of the machines or computers at your own will. Naturally, if you're rushing, a lot of times you forget to take your card out. So what we would do is we would collect them, and we put them in a safe, and if you remember it, you could spin the block and come back and pick it up. If you don't pick it up within 30 to 45 days, we cut them up and discard them. That's what was supposed to happen. Fast forward, I get offered a better job and I leave this said company, but I still have peoples at the company like anybody else. Now it's a couple people in the story, so I'm going to label them by letter. Ready? When I left the store, my homegirl A was the assistant manager and my peoples B was one of the regular associates. My homegirl A was dating one of my close friends from the block and we're going to call her C. I know I just fucked somebody up with them letters like that, but hey, listen. I'm home one day minding my natural black business and I get a phone call from C. C explains to me that A just got picked up by the DTs because B did a scam, got caught, and blamed it all on A. Yeah. If you didn't get that, run it back and just, yeah. So of course, I'm like, damn, that's fucked up. What happened exactly? 
before y'all ask, I'm not telling y'all to scam because just in case this story spins the block or makes it drowns around the block, I don't want no part of this. Listen, I don't care about Double Jeopardy. I ain't trying to go through that. So after C explains the story in detail, my exact response, that's fucked up. And if I was you, I would have beat that nigga ass. Verbatim, what I said. I come for C, she calmed down, we get off the phone, everything's fine, to my understanding. Fast forward, three days later, I'm walking through the lobby of my new job. I mean, suited and booted, hard bottom shoes, press shirt, tie, jack, fresh. I go to swipe my identification card through the turnstile to get access to the building that I work at. And as I hit the T with my shit, it don't T. Instead, two big ass detectives walk over me with a trench coat looking like fucking mob squad. Are you Karen Blanco? Because on my life, I know I don't fucking know y'all. And I know I ain't done shit to, to want to know y'all. So what y'all want? The black one's like, can we talk to you over here in this corner? And the white one's like, can you put your hands behind your back? There seems to be a disconnection in the force because I'm not doing either of the two. Let's spin the block and try this again. The fuck? So the head of security for the building I'm working walks over and he's asking exactly what the fuck is going on. And actually, I'm a good question because I want to know too. So the black cop tells the security guard that they have a warrant and they have some question that they like to bring me in for. Mind you, the three of them is talking like I'm not standing right the fuck there. So now I raise my hand because I know in about two more seconds, I'm going to act the fuck out. That one has to arrest me. The fuck? I was not expecting so many people to want a story time, but I guess it makes sense. Um, this is how I almost became a felon at 14. I want to preface this video with saying that this is not me glamorizing violence. This is not me glamorizing fighting. I don't condone violence. I think sometimes it's necessary, but as a kid, I was a violent kid. Okay, sorry change of scenery. I'm not going to make you go to a part two because I know that TikTok hates that. Um, I just moved schools. I went from a really small school to a really big school. My previous school had a graduating class of 100 versus this school had at least 6,000 students in it. So I was not prepared um, in any way, shape or form. And the white girls at this new school were a different breed. Um, when they came to prove a point, they came to prove a point, and that just wasn't me, like, I was a, a nerd, like, I looked like Harry Potter until I was probably 16 years old, and I liked to read books, like, I was not trying to wear your Cookie Monster sweatpants from Walmart, so, so I knew I was gonna get bullied, just based on the way that I looked, the fact that I was poor, like, I didn't have nice new clothes, uh, but this, what happened was not bullying, like, this was, this girl and her two friends terrorized me for months, every single day that we had school. Um, and I even tried to handle it the correct way. I tried to go to the principal and to the teachers, and I was told as a seventh grade student that it's just hazing and it's something that everyone goes through. Um, that was not okay for me. So every time they spit on me, every time they spit my food, every time they stole my belongings, I just put that shit in a file. And I was like, all right, I'm going to let this ride, and then I'll have my day at some point. So this goes on for months and months and months until one day after a football game, her and one of her friends tries to jump me. So they tried to jump me out in the parking lot and they brought a weapon of the pew pew variety. And um, I don't remember how it happened, but at some point I ended up with this weapon. And in my brain, it was me versus them. In my childhood brain, I was like, this is it. So I beat the fuck out of her face with the butt of this weapon, and I did go to jail, but I was not charged with anything in the long run because CCTV footage proved that it was self-defense um, and that they brought the weapon because they tried to lie and say that I brought it when weapons are registered, but... Um, yeah, so that's what happened. Nothing super crazy, but nobody fucked with me after that. And uh, I stand by what I said. You should have tried God, not me, because I wasn't the one.